good morning everyone and welcome. I am Fiona Hislop, I'm the uh, Deputy Convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and I'd like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Future Forum. This afternoon's panel is uh, titled Big Brains for Big Solutions Save the World and is held in partnership with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And we are delighted that so many people are able to join us online today. And I look forward to hearing comments and questions from you as we get into our discussion. And we look forward to receiving questions and comments. So how will academia and industry and events come together and build on the growing momentum to come up with the solutions that will save the planet from the climate crisis? And what are the barriers that our investors joining us today have already overcome to grow their respective businesses? And this panel aims to address all these questions in the next 60 minutes, uh, so do stay with us. So we're delighted that you're all able to join us to take part. I would encourage you all to use the event chat function to introduce yourself, state your name, your geographical location, pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. And I am very pleased to be joined by our panellists, uh, Pierre Paslier, um, Innovation and Design uh, Engineer and Co-Founder uh, co of NOPLA, uh, Dr. Olga uh, Kozlova, Director of Innovation and Industry Engagement, University of Strathclyde, David Farker, uh, Chief Executive of Intelligent Growth Solutions, and Dr. Jakanda uh, Pawan Tamvada, uh, Associate Professor in Strategy and Innovation at the University of Southampton. So there will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you'd like to make a contribution, please enter that in the question and answer box. Uh, make sure and state your first name and where you are this afternoon and or this, this morning, and we'll get through that as, as quickly as possible and as many as possible. So I, I want to just begin uh, by asking each of our panelists to respond to the following, please. Inventions in business, uh, from plastics to pesticides, weren't always kind to the environment, but now we need inventors and business to meet the new challenge of the climate emergency. Is that key collaboration between academia, entrepreneurs and investors taking place across the UK, or are we lagging behind the rest of the world in that respect? So, First of all, I want to come to Pierre. Pierre, could you kick off on, on, on that, uh, that question? Thanks for, hi, thanks for having me. Um, and I think that uh, like the UK is definitely a, a great place to be. We wouldn't kind of like have started this, this business here if we didn't think that there was something great to do. Um, I think that innovation is, is hard, uh, inventions are uh, taking a lot of time, and unfortunately, like, when it's harder to hire, or it's harder to kind of like move around uh, with the rest of the world and collaborate, it makes it harder to, to way to make things easier. Um, I think uh, the UK has a, a very great, um, kind of like, de facto position in the world, because of uh, like the like past history of connectivity with the rest of the world, so I think that this will will continue. But um, definitely, we're seeing that there's still some like uh, some obstacles for small startups to work with academia, to work with um, international investors, and and to accelerate. Because especially for uh, climate change, plastic pollution, the the clock is ticking, and we have to be very fast. Um, so it's 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 a pity that there are still a few obstacles. Um, to go faster. Thanks, Pierre. And I think that's a, a really important point about connectivity and connection and uh, creating the opportunities for creativity and innovation. And that's been a challenge because obviously the pandemic as well. Uh, can I maybe bring Olga? Could you respond to that? And then I'll come to David after that. Uh, thank you. So I think the there is a lot that UK universities can do in, in order to support that, um, uh, you know, innovation in the towards the net zero. And I think a lot is being done. Certainly, the universities 
are now part of what we call a triple helix approach where the industry, yeah. academia and government come together in, in terms of solving big societal problems and climate emergency is probably one of the biggest where at the moment result, a lot of efforts and resources being put uh, towards to I mean, we certainly see a significant amount of innovative ideas emerging from the research base and moving towards commercialization. I mean, I think there is always room for improvement, but certainly through, through some of the initiatives such as innovation centers in Scotland or UK catapults, uh, you know, the academia industry and investors do come together. I think where we particularly excel at in the early stages, because there is quite a lot of capital available from the business angels, I think when it's become more difficult when you're scaling up these businesses and there is a requirement for really large amounts of capital, particularly for some of the uh, pro infrastructure projects, and that's where sort of the availability of finance, I think, is becoming a challenge. But I can see that people are coming together and this, well, what I would call net zero ecosystem, is really coming together. I suppose the issue we might come on to is pace and scale, and, and does that allow us to be optimistic or not? And if we can come to David next, and then I'll come to you, Jag. David? Hi. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Fiona. The um, well, IGS, uh, I can only really speak from our perspective. I'm not an academic, uh, and I wouldn't say that I'm a you know, UK-wide R&D expert, um, but certainly from our point of view, the business was founded in 2013 and was based upon uh, R&D investment and innovation right from the get-go. Uh, we started by working with the physics department at St Andrews uh, to try and get on top of the whole issue of uh, LED lighting. So what my company does is vertical farming, uh, which means we're growing things in an enclosed box, so we have to make the weather, the sun, the wind and the rain, so we need artificial means of doing this. Uh, so we've had to innovate six subsystems. We've got to make the wind, we've got to make the rain, we've got to uh, make the sunshine, we've got to have software that controls it, we have to manage our energy usage and power, and then we have to have robotics and automated handling. So there are six areas in which we're having to innovate, and then we've got to bring the whole thing together to make sure that we can grow economically viable, environmentally sustainable, healthy, tasty food. Um, and I'm saying this deliberately to give you a sense of the number of hurdles we have to overcome before we can grow something that works for the farmer, the retailer, the consumer, and so on. But we've done KTPs, knowledge transfer pro programs. We have done uh, UK UAT uh, things. We have just um, agreed a research program with the Forestry Commission. Um, to look at growing uh, nursery-sized uh, trees inside the vertical farm. Um, and we've, we also work very closely with the James Hutton Institute, with whom we are co-located. We're going to be working with people like um, Aberystwyth in Wales, uh, I think the Royal Agricultural University from down south, and the um, Rowett Institute, so human nutrition as part of what we do up at Aberdeen. So. I guess what I'm saying is, for us to do what we need to do, and we're investing between one and two million a year in R&D, by the way, for us to do what we do, we have to do it within a network of relationships, uh, because we have to triangulate our engineering with crop science and with uh, agronomy or horticulture. That's absolutely fascinating, and, and clearly relationships are, are crucial to, to that development. Um, Jack, can you, can you maybe give your comment from what you see as the, the that kind of I suppose ecosystem and does, is it is it strong enough? Is it working at pace enough to to do what it would require it to do? Well, thank you so much, Fiona. I I echo what uh, the co-panelists have said. There's a lot happening. In fact, at Southampton, yeah. we have an on you know we have an on-campus accelerator where we are seeing a number of startups like Emic Wise and so on and so forth that are. Uh, focused on you know issues related to climate change and they want to reduce em emissions and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of things that are happening, and at the same time, I feel I believe there's a lot more to do. There's a lot more to actually take place. 
you know, uh, I mean, one, one good example I can give of the university collaboration we are having is the one we started with New Forest National Park Authority uh, here, very, you know, local to where we are. Uh, so the uh, and and the new course national park authority is part of a consortium that is building developing a green print for the region so there's there's a lot of good things happening and the universities are proactively involved in a lot of these initiatives but when it comes to industry business and investment uh, i think there's significant scope for further expansion but uh, having said that uh, as one of my panelists has said before the UK is a leader in terms of uh, the emphasis on climate change and what we are going to do about it. But having said that, I, I still believe that there's a lot more scope because we don't want to have about 20% of the startups that are focusing on that. We rather want to have 60% or 70% of our startups focusing on these issues. Thanks very much. And, and so clearly there is an issue about scale and pace and at what point of um, the uh, you know the, the startup or indeed the, the the idea generation and the product development does the relationship with financiers become critical and so therefore I'm quite keen to find out from your experience particularly uh, David and Pierre and uh, when you first approached financiers on this uh, or you know, what has the relationship been and when is it and you know, when is it key and we know from some of the evidence we've been taking in the in the committees about this the issue about you know, the, the difference between initial startups, but the scale up challenge and how do you work with financiers and how do we have we got the same appetite for investment for that scale up that we require? But um, Ed, David, if you can maybe reflect on that and then I'll, I'll come to Pierre. David? Yeah, sure. The, so the way that IGS has been financed um, between 2013 and when I joined in 2017, um, there were about four, um, three or four sort of angel rounds. Uh, it was mostly the founders, uh, friends and family, uh, and then some people he was introduced to. Um, there was a group from France. Uh, there was an individual from the UAE, but most of the other people were uh, private individuals from the UK. I think a total of about... Um, 10 million had been raised by the time I joined, uh, raised and spent, by the way. So <laughs> um, when I came in, uh, it was really to turn it from an R&D project into a real business. Uh, and so we spent 2018 engaging with the market. Uh, this was brand new to me. I didn't know what a vertical farm was. I didn't even know what agri-tech was before I joined. There was a huge amount of homework to do. but. It is a hot space, the one that we're in, and we found uh, three investors from the US. Uh, so our, we did a Series A round uh, in the middle of 2019 that was led by uh, S2G, uh, Seed to Growth Ventures in Chicago, who are backed by uh, Lucas Walton, a, a member of the Walmart family. Um, it, they were co-invested by Ag Funder from Silicon Valley, which does what it says on the tin, uh, uh, the Scottish Investment Bank, uh, as, 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 as was, uh, and then a second close with a New York hedge fund called Osprey, and they created a VC called Osprey Ag Science in order to invest in us. Um, we have more recently done the first close of our Series uh, B with a European uh, family office out of Switzerland, uh, and the final close on that will be with a Scottish fund and another fund from Chicago. So we will have brought in um, the thick end of uh, 40 million in inward, inward investment. Um, and uh, so that's pretty good news because it means that Scotland is a place where these people at VC and private equity level, if you have something that is world class and if it's a hot space, people will invest in Scotland. Um, there are a lot more targets they could have invested in in the United States. They did diligence on them. They turned them down and decided to come to little old Invergowrie. Right. So Invergowrie is the centre of the world on this. I'm glad to, glad to hear. <laughs> but it, but it is interesting that kind of real global reach in terms of um, you know putting together the financial uh, backing aspects of that and to see Scotland as a platform with that world-class research that we can do this. Uh, that's very, very impressive. And um, Pierre, I mean, maybe you might want to expand a bit more on your own experience 
with your own inventions and particularly in, in when you uh, had approached uh, financiers and what were the, the good points of that and obviously what were the challenges, Pierre? So um, yeah, in a nutshell, we develop packaging made from seaweed as an alternative to single-use plastic. And um, we started out of Imperial College um, with no kind of like background in business. So it definitely took us a, a little bit of like a learning curve to get our head around how do we fund the business. And I think um, for the first couple of years, we didn't do a really good job at attracting kind of like equity uh, finance. Uh, we were mainly surviving off grants. And that like, um, what I would say one of the obstacles sometimes is when your category doesn't really exist. Um, and I think what you were saying that is, is very interesting because I think vertical farming is now like a really well established area for growth and investment. Uh, but definitely the seaweed packaging wasn't at that point. And I think now it is becoming. And so it's always, how do we make sure that the things that don't necessarily fit in the box today, but are gonna be important in the future, the, like get the right uh, kind of like level of engagement. So uh, we basically failed to raise from any kind of like angel or family office or VCs for um, the best of nine months uh, of, of kind of pitching. And eventually we turned to uh, the crowd and we did the equity crowdfunding campaign with crowd. It's definitely a great option when you're in the UK, it's, it's, uh, the world has caught up on like equity crowdfunding, but I think the UK definitely was a, a major it was day and night. Like we raised 850,000 pounds in three days from 900 investors all around the world who put as little as 10 pounds for this to happen. But like the investors were a little bit kind of like too risk adverse. And I think that was our hardest uh, round because um, uh, no one wanted to be taking the first kind of like hit. Um, and after that, we found it a lot easier to start working with institutionals. We got a convertible loan from, from Sky Ocean Ventures, the, the fund of the media group that is focused on uh, removing uh, pollution in the oceans. Um, and then we did a seed round with VC uh, investors, in fact, VC investors from Europe and, and the US. And now we're about to kind of like announce our Series A uh, with, with a large VC fund uh, also abroad. So I think that, um, once you have the chance of proving yourself a bit of a track record, it becomes easier. And also the category became more evident uh, as we progressed. But definitely like the worry is that something that is going to be very useful in the future and that doesn't really kind of like resonate with anyone because they can't really put a name on it is going to still be very hard to fund. And I think that that's uh, um, hopefully something that is becoming kind of like, uh, like less of a problem with lots of funds that are uh, like taking more risk or having kind of like uh, innovation categories that are a little bit more kind of like loose, uh, but it's always a risk. Well, I think that this will come as a theme about how, how in the finance sector, particularly managing that risk and their responsibilities help us get to where we need to get to. And I, I wonder if I can come to you, Olga, first, um, looking at from the academic point of view, um, what you're seeing in terms of that uh, support by financiers for a startup and Pierre's point about how do you get people to put risk into something they have no idea what it is or it's it's not been really deployed yet and you know, is there a real appetite to do that or is there an understanding that the finance sector is going to have to get into this space and manage risk perhaps differently than they've done before in the climate emergency context so I'll, I'll ask Olga first and then Jag will come to you on that same point. Uh, that's actually a really good question uh, in terms of uh, the, the risk appetite of uh, financiers and investors at sort of at different stages. Um, I think that the first point I would like to make is probably that investors are looking for the best possible opportunities and when you, you're a company seeking and we from example at Strasclyde do a lot of support uh, on investor readiness and we're also you know, we have a Strasclyde inspire entrepreneurship strategy which is all looking at how university can support businesses at every stage of their journey ultimately and what investors are looking for is obviously a strong innovation, but they're also looking at that there is a good team behind the company. 
people with experience in business that they could trust in doing the right things with the funding they receive. So building this team and that's, for example, where universities can come in and tap in into our alumni networks and our international partnership to have built that team is one of the very important tasks. Moving on, I think there is, um, you know, a role to play uh, in from um, of, of building consortia of investment because investors because they do like to share risks, and quite often I mean, Scottish enterprise, for example, with their um, uh, invest uh, the co-investment fund is a really good too because it's the risks for private investors slightly the opportunities for them and the tax incentives that's put in EIS and SCIS reliefs that exist in the UK do help fund at these early stages. I mean, we certainly at Strasclite see that there is a lot more of these opportunities emerging in kind of net zero sector. And uh, I think investors now are more likely, for example, to look at, um, you know, to building a consortia, you know, across the sort of Europe or across the kind of the, the pond in terms of funding these, uh, these businesses. I think they have an appetite, but certainly I think the tax incentives are really important to make it, uh, it happen at the early stages. Um, so, I mean, there are great examples. I mean, we've just uh, closed around for a meat replacement company. 42 million euros has gone into enough which is basically providing uh, um, fungal proteins kind of as a meat replacing product. What helped to secure it is there is a horizon funding, European funding that went into it, again, de-risking that opportunity. So I think this is what we will need to look forward to, to make this work. That is interesting that kind of it's, it's nobody alone, it's that relationship, it's a consortia, it's about spreading the, the risk, but also that team and having a world-class team of all the different elements behind that. So, Jack, can I come to you? And, and obviously, if Pierre, David, wants to come back on anything, the pair just um, maybe put, give you an indication in the, in the chat that you want to do that. Jack? Yes, no, uh, I, I uh, build on what Olga has just said. There's a lot of that appetite, but what is not becoming uh, clear is that this is a real win-win strategy for both both uh, investors and entrepreneurs. I mean, there's increasing scientific evidence that suggests that when you invest in these uh, startups, you know, you're very likely to make a good return on investment. Uh, but that message has to go through uh, very clearly through the investment community. I mean, I've looked at the data of about 10,000 firms from across 35 OECD countries. And we do see that these those firms that are uh, uh, taking up greening activities are actually performing better in terms of their revenue increases in terms of this. I mean, it's all drawing from that growing conscientiousness in the broader society, what the value that these firms bring. And I think that message, once it becomes very clear to the investment community that, uh, you know, that there are significant returns to be made by such investments, we don't, you know, we won't be in a situation where our entrepreneurs have to first resort to crowdfunding or public funding, and then get to that invest, in, you know, investors uh, and right. investment. So you know, we don't have to uh, go in those layers uh, for un, you know for for that uh, funding to unfold. So it'll be interesting that it will the pace be that that will change that model that Pierre was talking about. That he went through may change in, the, in your perception. That's that you think that's going to be, be happening. Uh, I think David was going to come in on that, and then I've got a question from our audience that they want to put to. Um, David and I think um, Pierre also about in, uh, business angels. But David, yeah, sure. So I, I would say that the the investment community is acutely aware uh, of the um, opportunities that the climate crisis re uh, represent, and particularly where we sit. So we sit at the sort of uh, nexus of feed the world. Uh, and tackle climate change. And if you have, um, you know, anything to contribute to either, or in our case, both of those massive agendas, probably the two most important things uh, on the planet at the moment, as we aim, as, as, as we head towards like 10 billion of population, um, we're going to have to grow more food in the next 30 years than we have in the previous 10,000. I'm going to say that again. We have to grow more food in the next 30 years 
than we have in the previous 10,000 because the growth of the population is not a straight line. It is exponential. Uh, watch David Attenborough's um, uh, personal witness statement on Netflix. So whilst they are dreadful things, um, they are they, to financiers, they represent opportunity because if you can solve things as big as this, it is a way to make money and do some good. So if you go right from individuals through to VCs, they will label themselves as impact investors or ESG investors. Some of them will be clean tech or green tech. There's about four or five major labels. Uh, we had 70 approaches unsolicited uh, because of the amount of social media stuff we've done. And I would say 65 of them had some sort of clean, green, ESG impact type uh, approach. And even when you get to a public offering, you know, if you're going to IPO your business, people like Goldman Sachs and so on are mandated by the investors they're representing to find ESG things, even if it is a bit of a greenwash and, you know, box ticking. Uh, but we as entrepreneurs, it, it, even if that's the case, we may as well take advantage of it and take that money. So there is something about the power of the consumer and their expectation and the power of the public, which is also driving a lot of the uh, what you might call green investment. So you, you refer to Goldman Sachs. So if, you, if you look at all um, investment uh, companies themselves and their ESG statements. So um, there is that combination of pressure, I suppose, um, that may also then help in terms of that kind of um, access to, to volume and scale of, of capital investment. But I'll come to it. We've now got a question from Andrew in Edinburgh, and I'll come to you, Pierre, first on this one, and then to David. How much pressure is there from business angels to get a quick return on their investment in businesses like David's and Pierre? So, Pierre, can I come to you first? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I think in a way we we got lucky that we ended up kind of like going for an uh, equity crowdfunding campaign as a first financing round <clears throat> because it meant that we had a very um, fragmented cap table <clears throat> sorry and so it means that there wasn't a significant shareholder that could direct uh, in right? and it's very often the case in early stage startups <clears throat> the the direction uh, that they wanted to impose on, on the company um, and, and I think that's very often the case when uh, the founders are like first time founders and they don't necessarily have a lot of kind of like experience just yet. So actually getting this uh, equity crowdfunding campaign gave us a lot more kind of like freedom in driving the business the, 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 like towards the vision that we had as the founders. Um, and I think um, because the, the, like the sole purpose of Notply is to make this plastic packaging disappear, um, we also attracted people who are uh, like long-term and patient and want to uh, have uh, this uh, like this, this noble kind of like purpose as part of their mm -hmm. investment portfolio. So we haven't really had um, like the typical pressure that you can imagine from uh, like the investor that wants to quickly sell. Um, I think especially for early stage kind of like deep tech. Um, everyone knows that like the R and D cycles are long, and it's going to be really about kind of like uh, being patient before you can really have a, a massive impact and also a massive return. Um, and then obviously, like as we uh, moved forward with uh, some more kind of like institutional uh, VC funds, um, uh, like the environmental return is important, but like the economic economical return is 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 very kind of like important for their KPIs. Um, I think we've always had. Um, like after this first round, the luxury maybe of like picking who we wanted to work with. Um, I think what David said about like cold emails from like funds, I can absolutely relate to that. I think the, the investment world is super hot for investing in deep tech, um, kind of like uh, slightly de-risked uh, solutions. So we are probably getting yeah, like a, a call with an investor a week uh, who just wants to kind of like position themselves in sustainable packaging one way or another, but not all of them have great credentials. Not all of them have kind of like no strings attached with um, kind of like uh, maybe some strategic kind of like FMCG groups and so on. So um, we were able to pick the investors that really kind of like fit the bill for us for the long run. Uh, and as a result, it means that we are really on board with this idea that 
we're gonna have to nail this technology. We're gonna have to kind of like industrialize it. We're gonna yeah. have to kind of like commercialize it. Well, all of this is gonna uh, take more time than trying to kind of like do a quick return, sell on, and kind of like uh, reinvest somewhere else. So uh, there is something around, obviously, the quality, the world-class research that we are doing, but also in terms of the investment, how do you make sure you've got world-class investors other than, I suppose, in terms of what they're looking for in terms of return, if there is choice? So I don't know, if, David, have you got any comments from, on that? And then I, I, I'll come back to the audience. And, and, I mean, in terms of return, um, our valuation has gone up 10 times in two years. Um, <laughs> And it's going to go up again uh, because of the other approaches that, that we've had. So I'm very, very confident that there is a tremendous uh, return of, uh, available for investors. Um, and you know, our, our investors are also extremely supportive of a number of things that we're doing that may not immediately, you know, help uh, raise profits or, or raise value. You know, so they're they're patient, they're reasonably long term. Um, I've, I've just in response to a school teacher, uh, Marjorie Ann Stewart, I think it is, in the chat here, I've just said to her that um, uh, we've just invested half a million pounds building an a interactive educational facility in a pavilion on the Broomy Law with a five and a half metre high vertical farm inside it. Um, and it is totally free to the public. It'll be open throughout COP, 1st to the 12th of November. And it's aimed at schools groups, and it's going to teach them about uh, what's wrong with farming, at, uh, old at old farming practices, what's wrong with our food chains, how do they relate to the UN climate targets, how are they impacting climate change, and what can technology like ours do to help reverse those things. So it's designed to raise awareness uh, amongst you know school kids that there there are answers for for the future, you know, as per David Attenborough's documentary. Um, so, you know, that, that we've got total backing from our investors to do this. And uh, I think that's such an important point about this session was about, you know, can we be optimistic? And I'm getting the sense from you all that we can be optimistic. Um, I think Marjorie's point, she's from Dundee, uh, she's a teacher in technology at a secondary school, and she's saying that, I know there's a lot of great innovative work out there, um, but it'd be good if there was uh, it could be communicated more widely, not not least to inspire that generation, that next generation of inventors as well. So I think that's a very good point to to not just uh, think it is the th those that have got interest in investment and innovation that want to hear about this. There's a, a wider audience that need to know about that. And then we have a question from Roddy in Dumfries, and I, just, I suppose we're moving now a bit onto the innovation side as opposed to the investment side, but the innovation side. If, we're, if we are to use less, um, less oil, um, does that imply that a range of products will become unavailable? Um, are there alternatives to these project, uh, products? And what effect is that likely to have on the Scottish and UK uh, economies? Now, I, I'm sitting here in my, my home in Linlithgow, and uh, it's just turned into Sunday afternoon, and I've got Greensmouth uh, just uh, a few miles away from me. But it, it's clearly not just about the uh, vertical farming or the most obvious kind of product uh, alternatives, but there'll be products that people might not uh, think about will need to change. So I suppose in your um, you know, surveying of the work that's happening in your universities in this area, um, do you think that there's enough happening in, in that uh, alternative to what might have been the old, uh, I mean, we've heard from Pierre in, in, in terms of alternative in use on, uh, on plastics, but is there enough that you're seeing in this area? And I suppose, how do we know that everything's been touched? from farming to plastics to lots of different areas to know that we can have confidence and optimism um, that that innovation is happening. So I'll come to you first, Olga, and then I'll come to Jag on that. Olga. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I'm, um, I'm looking very optimistically into the future because I think, I mean, UK in general is full of innovators. And I think people, and particularly young people you see in our students, what they want to do is not just, you know, do a job or invent something. They actually care. They want to improve society. For them, it's really important that there is this positive element, not just ultimately making money, but doing greater good. I think the breadth and the depth of innovation is, is incredible in the UK. I mean, I can talk from examples of Strasclyde. We have student projects emerging that are looking of how to increase, for example, the use of 
um, uh, reusable cups, how it make it easier to wash a single cup in a small device that could be used in offices, etc. And that's just a small incremental kind of innovation. But we also have, uh, you know, we're very strongly working on electrification, for example, of, uh, you know, airplanes. We're looking on this, looking at the whole systems that we have, the energy system, and how we can, uh, using AI and, every, and data analytics, actually improve them. So it's a much larger scale projects. And I think is everything in between. Industrial biotech is an incredible sort of interesting space where we're looking at novel processes to, for example, to replace plastic or create, you know, meat, meat replacement, replacement products, as I've mentioned before. So I think in terms of, and that is just broadening, I think one of the great things about the UK ecosystem, academic ecosystem and innovation ecosystem, how collaborative it is, because what we see is that the best innovations are emerging sort of on the uh, on the interface between different disciplines, quite often policy comes together with, uh, you know, uh, new materials and engineering. We're hosting, for example, One Ocean Hub, which is looking at, at plastic pollution in the ocean, which has collaborators from 62 countries. And it led from our um, faculty of humanities and social sciences. So. I'm very optimistic about the future. I think we have the breadth and the depths of innovators, and I think now there is a real will to come up with the solutions. Thanks very much, Olga. Jack, what's your view on this? And obviously, in reference to alternatives to products that were previously obviously uh, manufactured from from oil based solutions. Thank you so much for that question. In fact, uh, I used to always wonder as to why we never had electric cars in the 2010s, and you know, in the last century. Uh, because, and, and similarly, I used to always wonder why the solar panels even today run on 20% efficiency. These, these are questions facing broader society as to whether innovators have been interested in producing these products, uh, which are much more sustainable, much more uh, you know, sens sensitive to what the emerging needs of the world are. Um, and what my feeling is, my, my conviction is that there's a lot more optimism uh, that we can have uh, because the next generation of innovators that we are seeing at the universities and in the broader society are trying to bridge that gap that will emerge when when we sort of get away from these old ways of doing things. So using products that are based on oil, using products and services that are uh, a lot more unsustainable in terms of uh, their general appeal. I, I think there's a lot more optimism that we can go with, uh, go forward with. Thank you. And, and uh, living in West Lothian as I am, I, oil was uh, you know, was discovered here first, but of course it was shale oil. But interestingly, the train that serviced um, that uh, you know that production facility was actually electric. The original going back over the years. So sometimes it might be it's not just the invention of the new products, but it's actually how you use products that are already there and scale it up. So. Uh, maybe that's a, a thoughtful piece as well. Um, we've got a question from Karen, and I'm, I'm going to put it to, to everybody. But to ask about Olga and Jag, are you seeing a generation of young people who want to be innovators to address the climate crisis? I think, uh, Olga, you've already kind of addressed some of that. But I might come to Jag first, and then Pierre, um, in terms of who you're working with and that network of of um, young innovators that are coming through and um, what you're seeing and the pace of what's happening there and their expectations um, you know, in, in terms of this agenda. But I'll come to you, Jag, about what you're seeing uh, you know, in terms of young innovators in particular. Um, as I, you know, as I said before, there is um, a, a wide group of uh, students and also faculty members at the universities who are pretty keen on producing those solutions. And it's just not it's not happening only in the UK, but I see this as a worldwide trend. Um, you know, having come from India, I'm seeing innovators from uh, India who are trying to produce uh, these kind of sustainable solutions for the world. In fact, the Earthshot Prize had um, eco innovators from around the world getting those prizes uh, that that were given a couple of days back. So I think there is this um, great sense of optimism, this this great sense of conscientiousness. That we are we are perceiving in, in 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 student community across the world, and that's that's a great reason for us to be hopeful. 
Thanks. And, and Pierre, what's your experience in your networks in terms of what is the next generation? Or you're still part of that you know, young generation of innovators, I'm sure. But is, you know, in terms of what you're seeing coming through, are they different from you know when you first got into this and what you're seeing in, in terms of their expectations and what they want to do or can do? Pierre. Have we got Pierre? Is he frozen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, am I back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, so I think um, what's really interesting, as you were mentioning, is that it's not necessarily always just kind of like inventing something brand new, but it's kind of like revisiting the past and re-updating it for uh, the kind of challenges that we're facing uh, moving forward. Um, so I think, um, especially like in our uh, field, we see a lot of interest in uh, like natural materials. There is so much we can do with natural materials. Um, so really exciting things that are going like away from synthetics, kind of like uh, things made in the lab and going back into understanding better nature. Um, certainly like in seaweed, uh, there's a lot going on in Scotland because that there's definitely like and it used to be a, like uh, a part of like the the UK that was literally producing uh, like hundreds of tons of seaweed product and that was employing hundreds of thousands of people back uh, a few centuries ago. So I think that like it's interesting to revisit some of these things. Um, I think it, it's really exciting that like uh, innovators that we uh, that we meet uh, like in the universities we work with or uh, like the the other kind of like solution providers we work with everyone is uh, very clear that they want to have that purpose in what they do so it's not just kind of like uh, like the thrill of running a business or the thrill of like developing a new technology but it has to make a, a real clear uh, impact um, so i think it's it's really great it gives me a lot of, kind of like confidence that um, there will be like a continuous growth of numbers of brains working on projects that really kind of like make a difference <clears throat> and uh, and i think like uh, again like back to that first question about like what are the obstacles i think that um traveling exchanging uh like working with other people is so crucial in developing that uh, that kind of like uh, level of inspiration of, of wanting to do something and i think that seeing that like for the multiple reasons that we've kind of like faced in the past kind of like few, few years. Um, there's been less of that and there's been more hurdles um, and like um, like we're getting, uh, like it's, it's harder for us to get interns from Europe uh, because you also need like uh, to get all of the visas. I think that's a huge kind of like obstacle for getting this kind of like next wave of people who want to do something kind of like good to actually get exposed to interesting things. So I think that um, we would benefit so much from lifting some of those kind of like uh, burdens and just making it easier for everyone to uh, go where they want to get inspired. Okay, um, I'll come to Jag and then I'll come to David. He's, he's indicated that interest. Jag. Uh, yes, and in fact, I was working with one organization in the US called Turning Green that brings around students from across the world to collaborate on these projects and then create impact. So, I mean, uh, there is this um, um, increasing sense of responsibility that I, you know, I, I see the, the students carrying all over the world. And that's something that I'll come back and emphasize again, that, you know, we need to support, we need to create an ecosystem that ensures that now we're not only thinking at the level of entrepreneurs, uh, who are these people making a transition into starting those businesses, but we are also thinking about students and future entrepreneurs, nascent entrepreneurs, and seeing how we can enable those nascent entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs so that those those ideas become viable products and services that the broader society can benefit from. Uh, but there is this uh, emerging um, sort of a wave uh, that is uh, that is not per perceived very obviously, but it is there. That is that that's that's happening right in the round nose. So I'll bring in David, and I saw Olga nodding, so I might bring in after David, Olga. So David first. Yeah, I, I am, one way in which I am op optimistic is, uh, you know, so my daughter turned 20 today. She's studying oceanography and marine biology. Um, she is absolutely passionate. I mean, she would marry David Attenborough if that were possible, but she's absolutely passionate about this whole thing. and. 
increasingly the people she hangs out with her friends and so on um, are equally passionate about this whole thing and actually to some extent they put my generation to shame I don't think they blame us I mean I, I, I know she loves her dad uh, but they know that it was our generation that's caused an awful lot of these problems and they I think they want to bring us with them uh, there's a massive growth in plant-based food and things. That's a huge sector adjacent to ours. Um, there's a real drive to avoid bad packaging and so on and so on. And I think it's this next generation that is really going to lead if we give them a chance. I've put into the chat an amazing film called Breaking Boundaries. Uh, it's by a Swedish professor. I would urge you to look, look at it. Uh, and he's identified the seven or eight major challenges we've got, and they do a kind of traffic light thing. And if you go from green to amber, you can go back to green. But if you go from amber to red, that's it. So I would really urge you to watch this. Um, but uh, we take Saltire scholars in every year into our okay. business. So these are third year un undergrad students. Um, and we also have, a, you know, we've gone from 25 to 140 people during lockdown the majority of those people are probably uh, under 35 um, and they and our Saltar scholars we had 20 of them this year um, are absolutely passionate about what IGS is contributing to so the sense of purpose is is there and I think that drive if we can support it and feed it uh, you know it's those people that are going to get us out of the hole we've dug for ourselves thanks David and, and can you wish your daughter happy birthday from uh, all of us and best wishes for her study. Uh, Olga, what's your reflections on this? I think what I want to go is, the, for example, the need of all of us, and particularly, I mean, we I do have like David a big hopes for younger generation is be in a sense more entrepreneurial, embrace it entrepreneurial mindset. It's not just about starting a business like David and Pierre did here, but in our kind of everyday life or an everyday job, whether people work for a third sector or for a government or for a university or for a small business, to look at potential for innovation. And sometimes it can be very small and incremental type of innovation to uh, make the practices everyday life more sustainable. So I think that's something where our particular educational institutions and by then I don't mean just universities but starting very it's sort of at a very early stage from even from primary school I know how my six-year-old daughter loved when she did a little enterprise project you know of making lemonade and then trying to sell it but you know harvesting their energy and building that entrepreneurial mindset I think can bring us a solution and the last point I will say is that innovation is not incremental, it's exponential. And I think that's what we'll see. We're now at this maybe early stage and we're not noticing it, but already with the amount of renewable energy that is being used, you know, it doubles every almost every couple of years. So I think that's where again another point for optimism. That's a very interesting perspective. And we have a question from Anna in Inverness, and I'll come to you, David, first. Is Scotland a good place to be an innovator? Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, here we are, um, absolutely. But it's all about your mindset. Um, you know, we, uh, we've just decided to go big. We've decided that the fact that we are in Scotland really has got nothing to do with anything from a global uh, perception point of view. Scotland is a great name. It's got a good brand. I think we are respected as a nation throughout the world. I think we have largely done more good than bad. I, you know, as well as being known for whiskey and salmon, uh, I think people do respect the Scottish Enlightenment, all the innovation that's happened over the years, and we definitely punch above our weight. But it's it's all up here. You have got to be ambitious. You know, we have set ourselves a target of putting vertical farms on six continents within uh, three years. We're already on four. Um, we have reached out to world leaders to come and see what we're doing um, at COP26, and the response has been incredible. Um, we are continuously uh, punching ridiculously above our weight. The article, the, the one I've put here, um, The Economist, Blood, Sweat and Dreams, that's been watched by almost half a billion people. You know, it is absolutely amazing. And so I think that what we should not do 
his worry about being Scottish. I think flip that on its head. Let's be incredibly proud, but let's go out uh, and be really great neighbours. Uh, let's not go and colonise. Uh, let's be friends to the rest of the world. And I think if you have ambition and that positive attitude, uh, then I, I, I think the sky's the limit. And, that, and that's uh, really inspiring. And, and clearly, I think we can do this. And it's that, that sense of ambition that is hugely important. So, Pierre, uh, what do you think about Scotland as a place to, to do innovation? Are you, are you up for it? I mean, like the whole reason that um, I came to the UK is that I thought that there was something really interesting happening. And I felt doing it in the UK rather than in my home country in France. So. Um, it, I think it shows that like um, you can really like take your kind of like your background and you can make whatever you want to happen wherever you want to go. I think for us, um, we uh, like we see a lot of advantages if, in being uh, in being in the UK and like there's tons of kind of like uh, good reasons to kind of like stay here. There's also like some challenges, but as uh, David was saying, it's like a mindset. There's always going to be challenges, and you have to kind of like um, you have to power through. Um, in particular, because we use a lot of seaweed, I think like Scotland is definitely a, a hot spot. Uh, and 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 sadly, um, the last kind of like uh, seaweed extract kind of like factories closed uh, uh, a couple of decades ago. But I'm really hopeful that in the next kind of like, years, uh, a few are going to open. There's definitely a lot of kind of like seaweed farms. That are popping up all around the coast. So, as far as like the seaweed industry, Scotland is uh, definitely a hotspot. Okay. Um, now we've got a question from Roddy. Um, what pragmatic outcomes do you hope will result from COP26? Which I'm sure everybody's asking everybody at this point because we're obviously only got a few days to go. Um, Olga, can I come to you first and then to Jang? Olga. I think it's 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 a really good question. I think it's a million dollar question, if I may be honest. I think I do hope that there will be some practical agreements coming together that could be implemented. And I think it's that that actually that they. I don't think it's just about you know what they agree, but I think that the getting an agreement and everyone around the table. I think that is crucial because. This is one of these challenges that no one country can solve on its own. It needs to be a buy-in across the world leaders. And I think that's where the main challenges are. I think there is a lot of hope going into there. At the same time, I think there is this worry that whether you know actually the leaders have the chance to put maybe their specific country's interests slightly to the side and think about the global good. So that, for me, would be the, probably the biggest thing. And then I think there is there is there a lot of desire to do good thing. We just need, need a bit of an agreement of how we're going to go about it. Okay, Jack. I think there will be uh, significantly positive outcomes coming out of COP26, and for reasons that Olga just mentioned, you know, they're all coming together. That itself is quite an accomplishment. Uh, on, on this uh, on this note, um, I'm I'm fairly confident that something tangible and something positive will come out of it, but I don't know what that will be. Okay, well we're we're coming to a close. There's a, another question coming in. I just wonder, and I'm going to give you an opportunity all to reflect on one area we haven't touched on. Of course, this is a Parliament Festival of Politics, and what is the role of government and uh, regulation and policy? But I, I think it's quite clear from everything you've said. There's a combination of everything from the innovation, from the public, uh, from uh, the uh, investors, that whole, and um, it was described as an ecosystem. But how do you make sure that that's a, in the strongest place it can be? And how do you make sure Scotland is in the strongest place to do that? But one of the final questions, and, and when I come to you for your final sort of minute of, of, of remarks each, um, David from Glasgow is challenging us to, as panellists to, to tell us about three great innovation they know about and the public might see in the next five years. So I think there's an appetite here to know what we don't know or what might be coming down the track. You may or may not know that, or you could punt and, and take a guess. But uh, any of that in terms of your reflections of, of what you've heard in, in terms of, of that. And I, I think I'll start with you, Jag, and, and then I'll move to Pierre. So Jag first on this final roundup of your final comments. 
Yes, I think there is a lot of scope for public policy to come into picture here uh, in terms of supporting green entrepreneurs and innovators. There are several things that can be done and there's a need for thinking through the process so that uh, the, 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 the entire agenda is supported. As one example, very quickly, you know, there could be a platform where all these products and services are showcased worldwide so that new markets open up for you know, the excellent ideas that are being you know, supported in the UK that are being, um, you know, that are transforming into entrepreneur, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ventures and so on and so forth. It's all about getting the message out and that's something we should uh, put a focus on. And that's interesting, that's what Margaret from Overest I think was suggesting as well. Uh, Pierre, what's your final comment? Um, so on that previous kind of like uh, question about what's coming up, I think it's super exciting that there's a bunch of stuff that we don't even kind of like know about that are coming uh, like in the pipeline. And I think that's that's what I love about like um, the innovation kind of like scene is that like you always get surprised at what people come up with. I think it's like really refreshing that there is a, like no shortage of uh, interesting ideas. And in a way, I think um, entrepreneurs are definitely like uh, doing their best to rise to the, the challenge that we face. I think uh, we talked about like uh, like the financiers. There, there's definitely a lot of like money available to give a shot to these uh, to these ideas. Um, and and I think like when it comes to uh, kind of like governments and and politics, um, there's definitely kind of like um, like maybe a lot of resentments from having seen a lot of kind of like uh, time spent on not really moving fast. Um, I think overall uh, with COP, um, th there's, there's been a lot of kind of like previous like opportunities for getting some strong commitments that haven't really happened. So I think like the expectations are definitely like quite low that something significant is gonna come out of it. But if you look at it the other way, there's a massive opportunity for politicians and kind of like world leaders to re-inspire all of their people and show that they can like really do some great stuff together. Um, because right now people have like little faith that there's gonna be some sort of kind of like collaboration the same way they see collaboration on their day-to-day -day life. And I think that that's uh, like, that's something that could change very rapidly. And I really hope that like um, we get kind of like uh, proven wrong and that, that these things happen but i think yeah like massive opportunity uh when when expectations are quite low but thanks pierre and i think we're all trying to uh, you know, hope that uh that, that was, you know, the government's come good, I think, is to, to say it briefly. Um, we've only got about a minute each for Olga and David, so your final reflections, Olga, and then I'll come to David. Olga. Um, okay, I'll be very quick. I think what I'm ho looking for is the pandemic demonstrated how quickly we can move if there is a the right regulatory environment and the right amount of investment to bring completely new products to the market. You know, we're talking about vaccines and all the tests, etc. I'm looking and I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen, that with the right regulatory amount and the investment, we actually can accelerate our innovation toward next zero. And in particular, I think carbon capture and storage will be a massive area going forward. So, and I'll stop there. All right, I'll move on to David. Um, I worry a great deal about Australia selling coal to China and India refusing to stop using coal and Brazil's attitude and so on. Uh, if we want to flip that, um, there is something the Scottish government, maybe the UK government can do. Vertical farming is cleaner than organic farming. We do not burn diesel. Uh, diesel tractors uh, still uh, get a tax break on what they call the red diesel with the dye in it. Um, that is not going away anytime soon. So why don't we give vertical farmers, that's not us, that's our customers, uh, a tax break on renewable energy and take the, tar the, the tax piece off that tariff because we are much cleaner than organic. We're not burning any fossil fuels, any carbon whatsoever. And I think it's inequitable that uh, people who are are getting a tax break and our farmers are not. So my plea would be, Please, can we change that and give uh, reduced tax, renewable energy, people using our vertical farms? 
Thanks, David. And I hope a lot of people come and see your exemplar vertical farming that you were talking about earlier on. Um, I'm afraid that we're going to have to end there. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today, making such a big contribution and really interesting, fascinating and inspiring. Um, so thank you to our panel and uh, they're brought to you in partnership with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank our panel, Dr. Olga Kozlova, uh, Pierre Pazdier, uh, David Parker and Dr. Uh, Draginda uh, Pawantamboda uh, for taking, uh, giving up your time to be with us on this day. So uh, I just want to remind you uh, that later on today at the Festival of Politics, we have a fascinating discussion about the role culture and art plays in our health and wellbeing. That's at two o'clock. And then a panel about how to make our cities resilient in the face of climate change. And finally, there's a panel later on on prioritising mental health. So I do hope you can join these discussions. And thank you to our panel and best wishes for all your endeavours. And I think you have set out a case for optimism. Thank you. <laughs>